Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to our worship service for this Sunday, October 4th. Welcome to October. Hopefully you've been enjoying the cool weather. I know I have. Uh, blessings to you all. I know break is going to be coming up soon for the kids. Other things are going on. Well, continue to stay safe. Continue to be healthy. Continue to do what you need to do. As always, if you need something, let me know. That's why I'm here. Even if it's just you haven't talked with me in a while, shoot me an email. Give me a holler. We'll get in touch. That's just my reminder before worship this Sunday, brothers and sisters of Christ, specifically for those who are off at home. Now, let us take a brief moment together, hearts and minds, for worship. Now, as the people of God, we gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. As the scriptures promise, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Whatever good we may have done is nothing compared to the righteousness of Christ. Whatever wrong we may have done is nothing compared to the grace of God. Now, with faith in Christ's righteousness and confidence in God's grace, let us together confess our sin. And so together we confess. Loving God, God, you have planted us like a vineyard on a fertile hill. You cleared away the stones, planted us with choice vines, and kept watch over us by night and day. But we have not yielded the good fruit you expected or desired. We are overgrown with sin, Show us with violence and injustice. Forgive us, we pray. Uproot our evil, prune away our sin, and shower upon us the gift of your grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our salvation does not depend on anything we have done, but comes from the grace of God alone, through faith in Jesus Christ. This is the good news in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Amen. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our opening song is Come. Now is the time to worship. the sun rise and set. He is, is faithful, faithful from generation, generation to generation. 
God makes summer and winter come and go. He is faithful from generation to generation. God helps plants grow and flowers bloom. He is faithful from generation to generation. God gives us food to eat, places to live, and people to love us. He is faithful from generation to generation. God is always with us. He is faithful from generation to generation. God keeps his promises to us. He is faithful from generation to generation. Let us praise our faithful God. So let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, hello, my little new friends. Pastor Mike here. We're back in the church kitchen because I got something a little messy here. But if you look here, I got some rocks in a bag and I got some sand in a bowl. And this is one of my favorite examples of something that I call and this is a big word that your parents might use for you, and it's called priorities. Yeah, Pastor, he's using his $10 words again, right? Priorities. Now, what is a priority, Pastor? Well, a priority is talking about what is more important than other things. Sometimes in our life, we need to remember what's more important than other things. Sometimes it might be the responsibilities we have in picking up our room are more important than playing video games. Sometimes our, it might be that we're supposed to eat healthy is more important than eating candy, or playing with the dog might be more important than going playing with our friends sometimes. Priorities. But even God thinks when it comes to him, we should have priorities. And here's the funny thing about God and priorities. If we put the right priorities first, we always tend to get everything done, including the fun stuff. My favorite example is this. These rocks and this sand only go in this cup if they go in in the right order. If I had my priorities straight. If I put the sand in first, all the rocks won't fit. They'll be sitting out of the top and those sorts of things. But if I put the rocks in first, the sand will fit. Now I keep going back and forth on whether I should do the sand first to show you, but uh, I tend to make a big mess and I'd rather not clean it up. So we'll do it the right way the first time. How about that? So I'm going to put my rocks in. assistant brought me a, a funnel. And it fits. No sand, no that, and we see the little that spilled. And that is the great lesson of one of our stories today from the Bible, is that when our priorities are straight, everything fits. It might be tight, but it's all there. All right, my little loosens, blessings. Talk to you later. Bye. Our first reading for this morning comes from the fifth chapter of the book of Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected to yield grapes but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more is there to me for me to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. 
I will also command the clouds that they rain and no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his plans and planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A psalm for this morning is from Psalm 80. Please join me in its reading. Restore us, O God of hosts, lest your face shine upon us and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow, and the towering cedars by its boughs. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall? so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes. The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven. Behold and tend this vine, preserve what your right hand has planted. Our second reading for this morning comes from the third chapter of the book of Philippians. Now Paul writes, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet, whatever gains I have, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. Righteous from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let us greet the gospel by singing together, Alle, Alle, Alleluia. <laughs> First chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Now, Jesus said to the people, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenant seized his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they were treated in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenant saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death, and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, 
Have you never read in the scriptures, the stones that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are in the third part, the third installment of these vineyard parables. They have been tools to teach the Pharisees about the coming reign of God and enlighten the church that is to come on what mission and ministry should look like. Again, in the first story, we had the payment of the vineyard workers and the two sons were the second installment. The vineyard and paying those workers was about justice in the kingdom. The two sons was about, uh, again, forgiveness and change of heart and the will of the Father. Now we have the story of a harvest, of how the harvest takes place. And unsurprisingly, the master wishes to collect his produce. Now there were tenants he leased this to, and he was not nearby. Because again, he'd done some amazing work. He had built this watchtower, protection, good vines, everything. Boom, 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 he had done this. And you'd assume that this would be as the gathering of this fruit, of sending of this servants to get his produce it would be a time of celebration because let's be honest harvests are celebration times cultures across the world throughout history have numerous celebrations it's oktoberfest for um the germanics people um we have numerous other ones i know india has numerous celebrations i was there when i was there for uh, one harvest of one crop and it was a fun time i think it was sugarcane uh, we have, even in Judaism, um, Sukkoth, Temple Festival of Booths, is considered a harvest festival. Pentecost is a harvest festival. We have these things as part of our reality. And even as, I think, farmers throughout history in the U.S., when they bring in the harvest, they do so with joy and ultimately with Thanksgiving. Harvest time. The harvest, harvest turns south here, does it not? Because to this amazing vineyard that I had talked about, that the tenants had been living in and enjoying and working in, did not treat the servants well. What happened? When the servants came, one was beaten, one was stoned, one was killed. More servants were sent, and the same happened over and over again. When the master tried to get what was his, his servants were treated horribly, killed. So at his wit's end, he sends his son, his son, to go get what was his. The son is sent, and how do they treat him? They kill him. This is the story that is told. And even as he tells it, there is so much symbolism aimed at the Pharisees. And hopefully you remember, because the symbolism is important, the symbolism of God's kingdom and God's reign. Remember with the other parables that, as I mentioned, the two sons, the payment of the workers, that it is how God's kingdom works. And it shows us our life in the kingdom and also how God functions as the Lord of the kingdom and of the vineyard. But here's the rub. There's also another text, our first lesson, that the Pharisees know well. And there's always that subtext in these parables. For our first text, hopefully you have remembered it, is another story of a vineyard. And it is Israel. And God laments through the prophet on how he has tended, he has done everything right. But it produces wild grapes, sour grapes. It does not 
yield good fruit. And that is a struggle. So what does he do? What does he do? So, Pharisees knew this. He knew that the vineyard is also about Israel itself and God's judgment upon Israel. And they knew that this was also aimed at them. Because even in his explanation of the parable, he tells the Pharisees point blank, point blank, that they are wicked tenants who have not taken care of Israel. That Israel, that Israel is the vineyard and they have not taken care of it. They have not borne fruits for the master, but tried to bear fruits for themselves and their ways and their desires. And they would destroy the prophets. They would destroy anyone who was trying to come from the master, including his son. And ultimately, that proves true on Good Friday. It is fascinating. All that is happening here. All that is happening here as Christ confronts the Pharisees about their greatest sin. Them trying to take over the vineyard, God's kingdom, God's reign, for themselves. Because what is the reason, ultimately, that they kill the son, that they take him out and kill him? Why? Because they want the vineyard. They want it for themselves, right? They don't call him the son, they call him the heir. That this ultimately, when the master is gone, if they can get rid of the master as well, if they get rid of him, they'll get it. They'll sneakily be able to get the vineyard. So let's kill them all. They are willing to sacrifice the relationship of the master who did all of this, who has been tending them as well, caring for them and his vineyard. Willing to destroy that relationship for this gain, for their way and their greed. Now, this is what's going on at this time with this story, with this explanation. All of these pieces, and I know this is a lot. And I always feel a need to explain this. And we even run into then the problem of, wow, so what does this have to do with us? For this parable seems very focused. A very small audience, the Pharisees. But brothers and sisters in Christ, this, even though it is a small audience, is important for us. Because for life in the kingdom, this functions as a warning and as a reminder to who God is for all generations. And this is a hard one. And so I try to preach it with love because it is hard. And the warning for the Pharisees is the warning for the Church of Christ in every age. That we will be tempted. And I say we. I'll say we are tempted to in our piece of the vineyard, the church, be more concerned with our way, our vision, our ownership, than our relationship with God and following the master's will for the vineyard. It's happening. I, myself, have to remind that part of me that enters into conversation with other pastors or folks in the community when they say things like, hey, so which church is yours, pastor? That the yours is a word that means relationship, not ownership. For it is tempting to assume when I say my church, that it is ownership. I can never possess a church. I can only have a relationship to a church because I can't afford the bill of ownership. Uh, only Christ can. And he paid it in spades with his blood. I can't afford that bill. And I always need to remind myself that he bought it and he's got the receipts. That is always important. Because throughout history, we see it over and over again. Paul struggles with people that want to own churches. The Reformation struggled with ownership of the church. Israel, all these times, we look over and over and over. And people try to get in the way of God's reign and his way. And it's a struggle. It's hard. It's a danger. But brothers and sisters in Christ, it is not worth that relationship with God himself 
for control for all these things. That is the hard part. In our fear and our worry, we want it to be ours. But it can never be. It can be, again, in the right order, very good. When our relationship is with God, and it is in the community of the church, we can gain that for the church and for the world and use the gifts and skills and abilities we have for that, that we have the right order. Too often we start with ourselves and our wants, our desires and our skills, and how do we, how do we make sure they're important in the church and God comes last. So I did the children's sermon, I did. God, our rock, is the priority in our relationship with now that could seem like a lot of law. I know that. But brothers and sisters in Christ, the only reason I can say those things is because of who God is and the fact that he does not give up on the vineyard. He doesn't. He never will. Over and over and over again. Patiently, he tends it. He works it. He guides it. He will always, even if there's a bad run of tenant, tenants and tenders, he will get the right people in. He will send his very son to make sure it bears fruit. He does not give up on us, even if we have messed up priorities. It might seem rough when he tries to reset them, but it is good. Trust that, brothers and sisters in Christ. No matter if we lose sight, or if we feel parched and that we are not being tended and our fruits are not worthy of the kingdom. He will come and tend us and prune us and grow us so that our fruits are sweet from the vine. Know that he is a patient, patient farmer. Amen. Our song of the day is the church's one foundation.
Let us together, together confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, with confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the Church, the world, and all those in need. We pray for our presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton, our NAS bishop, Jeffrey Clemens, our missionary, Kristen Engstrom, our companion churches both in Tanzania and in India. Holy God, you call us to work for peace and justice in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your light that we may bear fruit through work and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the abundant harvest of the earth. Bless and care for those whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables of all who hunger. May we be inspired by your servants who care deeply for your creation, especially Francis of Assisi, whom we commemorate today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Curb the impulses of greed and pride that lead us to take advantage of others. Grant that world leaders seek the fruits of the kingdom for the good and welfare of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain all who suffer with the promise of new life. Assured of your presence, heal our pain and suffering and equip us to embrace all bodies aching for wholeness of mind, body, and soul. We call to mind those who are struggling today, especially those affected by COVID-19, those who are working toward peace and harmony, those who we have on our prayer chain, and those we name aloud in the silence of our heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray for all managers in our community and for all who seek employment. Give hope in the future to those who lack meaningful work, those who have been marginalized or abused in the workplace, and those who desire new opportunities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for all the saints who teach us to live faithfully in your vineyard, especially Theodore Friedman. May our chorus join theirs until our labor is complete. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, in your hands, Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Peace, Lord, be with you always. And also with you. Please share that peace with everyone. Obviously, being peace bearers in our world is a great gift. Uh, again, thank you to everyone who continues to support the ministry. Um, thank you to everyone who continues to do what they can. Uh, thank you for all those who continue to pray for the church, uh, its leadership, uh, and everyone here. Uh, all I ask is you continue to be as faithful as you can as you tend the little vineyard where you are. Well, blessed brothers and sisters, let us continue worship with our offerings. Our offering song is Give Thanks. <laughs> Pray together our offering. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world. Through the bread of life, 
Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our song of thanksgiving is in Christ alone. Now then, brothers and sisters in Christ, God blesses us with his word, and it tends us and grows us in the vineyard. So let us give thanks for that gift. Let us pray. Praise, Praise and thanks, thanks to you, holy God. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word, you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts. Freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O oh God, we, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. Send your spirit of truth, O oh God, rekindle your gifts within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love. For the sake of a world in need, faithful to your word, O oh God, draw near to all who call on you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you is the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the blessing. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you all now and forever. Amen. Our sending song is Cornerstone. Thank you. 